my dear lady, how no. very nice to meet you. Do come in. Now, won't you come and sit down? Now, <laughs> right. Um, uh, would you get Miss Morehouse a cup of tea? Or, or is it Mrs. Morehouse? Is my marital status really your concern? Uh, no, 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 no. It's just that you know, I, you know, I was just uh, really worried about the whether the. Uh, uh, would you get uh, you know her a cup of tea? <laughs> <laughs> now, what should I call you, Mrs. Morehouse? <laughs> you can call me Agnes. What Agnes. should I call you? Um, well, you didn't call me Sir Humphrey. <laughs> oh, my dear lady. I'm not your dear lady. Don't patronise me and cut out the sexist crap, OK? <laughs> uh, OK, Agnes. Uh, uh, now, the reason I wanted us to have this little meeting was because I wanted us to try and understand one another. Basically, I'm sure we're in agreement. Really? Yeah, well, obviously you have your own views about how Britain should be run, but I'm sure we agree on a fundamental basis of order and authority. That's half true. Half true? You agree, I don't. <laughs> but it's obvious. It's obvious if you've got it made under the present system, then you want to use authority to preserve your privileges. But what about the homeless? What about the unemployed? What about the poor people? Oh, yes, yes, I know all about them. <laughs> <laughs> really? What do you know? Well, I've read all the published papers. I've seen all the statistics. I've read all the official reports. Believe me, dear lady, Agnes, dear, I... I... <laughs> I do know all about them. Fine. What does half a pound of margarine cost? <laughs> what does half a pound of margarine cost? Oh, um, how should I know? Um, 20p. 20p? Well, two pound 40, I don't know. Right. Why should you? What time do Social Security offices open? How long can you run a one-bar fire with 50 pence in the meat? I'm not entirely sure I follow. Of course you don't. If you knew that sort of thing, you wouldn't agree about using authority to support the system. Look, look, I do understand. I do sympathise. It'd be marvellous if there's no poverty, but we just don't have the resources to achieve that. Who hasn't? The nation. Really? Does this desk belong to the nation? <sighs> this china? Porcelain. <laughs> These portraits? Or are they your own? Of course not. The government property. Oh, good. They should fetch about, what, 80,000? That should keep 20-odd one-parent families for a year. Then what about your salary? That has nothing to do with it. Good. <laughs> then we'll have that, too. <laughs> Leave you £100 a week. That's 70,000 a year for the needy. Look, my salary is merely part of a complex economic structure. Good. We'll simplify it. After all, you don't want to make a profit out of serving your country, do you? <laughs> ah, tea. <laughs> Over here, I think. Uh, oh, very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, shall I be mother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, tell me, um, Agnes, <laughs> this policy of yours uh, of um, only allowing free-range eggs to be sold in your borough, how does this help poverty? Animals have rights too, you know. A battery chicken's life isn't worth living. Would you want to spend your life packed in with 600 other desperate, squawking, smelly creatures, unable to breathe fresh air, unable to move, unable to stretch, unable to think? Certainly not. That's why I never stood for Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bernard, I want to have a word with you about Professor Marriott's article. Yes, I think it's about time we reform local government. Do you, Bernard? Yes. <laughs> At least I think I did. <laughs> uh, that is, I'm not wholly against it. Although there are many uh, convincing, uh, some might say conclusive, arguments against it. Some might indeed, Bernard. <laughs> yes. Why? Because, Bernard, once you create genuinely democratic local communities, it won't stop there. Won't it? Well, of course it won't. You see, once they get established, they'll insist on more power. And the politicians will be too frightened to withhold them, so you'll get regional government. Uh, would that matter? Bernard's going to sit down. <laughs> Bernard, what happens at the moment if there is some vacant land in, say, Nottingham, and there are rival proposals for its use, you know, a hospital, a college, or an airport? 
Well, we set up an interdepartmental committee. Department of Health, Department of Education, Department of Transport, Treasury, Environment. Ask for papers, hold meetings, propose, discuss, revise, report back, redraft, a normal thing. Precisely. Months of fruitful work. <laughs> Leading to a mature and responsible conclusion. But if you have regional government, they decide it all in Nottingham. Probably in a couple of meetings, complete amateurs. It is their city. And what happens to us? Well, much less work. Yes, much less work. So little that ministers might almost be able to do it on their own. So we have much less power. Well, I don't know whether I really want power. Bernard, if the right people don't have power, do you know what happens? The wrong people get it. <laughs> Politicians, councillors, ordinary voters. But aren't they supposed to in a democracy? This is a British democracy, Bernard. <laughs> How do you mean? British democracy recognises that you need a system to protect the important things of life and keep them out of the hands of the barbarians. <laughs> Things like the opera. Radio 3. <laughs> the countryside. The law. The universities. Both of them. <laughs> and we are that system. Gosh. We run a civilised, aristocratic government machine tempered by occasional general elections. <laughs> Since 1832, we have been gradually excluding the voter from government. Now, we've got them to a point where they just vote once every five years for which bunch of buffoons will try to interfere with our policies, and you are happy to see all that thrown away. Uh, well, uh, no, 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 I, I didn't mean... Uh, but Bernard, do you want the Lake District turned into a gigantic caravan site? the Royal Opera House into a bingo hall. <laughs> the National Theatre into a carpet sale warehouse. Well, it looks like one, actually. <laughs> we gave the architect a knighthood so that nobody would ever say that. <laughs> Do you want Radio 3 to broadcast pop music 24 hours a day? And how would you feel if they took all the culture programmes off television? I don't know, I never watch them. Well, neither do I, but it's vital to know that they're there. <laughs> but you always said local government was corrupt and incompetent. Well, so it is, Bernard. So corrupt and incompetent that even ministers recognise it. So what about next year's Arts Council grant? Are they going to get the extra 30 million? Oh, my dear Simon, I couldn't disclose the figure in advance. Least of all to the managing director of the National Theatre. Huh? Have some of these. <laughs> Excuse me. Only six? You're not serious. I'm afraid that's the new diet. Six breadsticks is the absolute maximum. Is that gross breadsticks or net breadsticks? <laughs> net breadsticks. So what are we going to get to the National? Only one. <laughs> That's disastrous. How can they expect us to manage on one and a half million pounds? I don't know where you got that figure from. <laughs> You've got to help me. What can I do? You mean, if the grant figure, which of course we do not yet know, were to be not merely less than you told the press was the absolute minimum to stave off disaster, but lower even than the real minimum required to stave off disaster? Yes. Well, I'm afraid I can't help you, even though I'm on the board. Let me be quite clear about this, Simon. I am here to represent the Prime Minister's interest. Now, there are certain things which would gravely upset him. I must urge you on his behalf not to contemplate them. Good. What are they? <laughs> well, you'll be making the speech introducing him at the... Um, awards dinner, it would be a courtesy to send a draft to number 10 in advance. For approval? Well, let's say for information. Now, the Prime Minister is extremely anxious that the speech should not refer to the modesty of the grant increase. There are certain words that he would like you to avoid. Miserly, <laughs> Philistine, 
barbarism, skin flint, killjoy. He would also like you to avoid all reference to how much more other countries spend on the arts. What are the figures? There you are. To make sure you don't mention them by mistake. It certainly won't mention them by mistake. And thirdly, and most important of all, he wants absolutely no comparison between the extra money your theatre needs and certain sums that the government spent last year on certain projects. Such as? Well, let's say the figure were to be four million, uh, purely as an example, of course. Now, the Prime Minister earnestly hopes that your speech will not refer to the fact that the government spent five million on radar equipment for a fighter plane that had already been scrapped, <laughs> or that the Department of Energy had been able to afford to stockpile a thousand years' supply of filing tabs, <laughs> or that another department had stocked up with a million tins of vim, <laughs> etc., etc., etc. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was delicious. Yes. He never even goes to the theatre, does he? Well, he can't really. He's frightened of giving the cartoonist and gossip columnist too much ammunition. You see, he couldn't go to a month in the country for fear of starting rumours about a general election, and he couldn't go to your marvellous production of The Rivals, because there have been so many cabinet ministers after his job. And he couldn't go to the school for scandal. Well, not after the education secretary had been found in bed with that married primary school headmistress. <laughs> Prime Minister, yes. um, do forgive me, gentlemen. Yes. You remember Simon Monk, oh, don't you? Monk. Yes. This is very bad news about the grant, Prime Minister. Surely not. It's gone up. Nothing like enough. Well, enough for it to be unnecessary for you to. Uh... I'm afraid not. Oh. Oh, because I was hoping to do something really significant next year. You remember you were saying that you had to spend nearly half your grant on the upkeep of the buildings? Yes. Well, I have a plan that should relieve you of that. Really? Oh, that would be marvelous. Yeah, wouldn't it? And it'd make the National Theatre really national, too. What do you mean? I'm thinking of selling the National Theatre. <laughs> selling it? I knew you'd be pleased. <laughs> that way we can save three millions on upkeep. Prime Minister, this is impossible. No, it's quite easy, actually. We've had a terrific offer for the site. But the National Theatre must have a base. And so it will. You could have inexpensive offices in Brixton or Toxton. <laughs> Middlesbrough. <laughs> What about the what about the theatres? What about the workshops? Then well, you could hire them like any other company. Put on your productions in the West End or the Old Vic or the provincial theatres. Become strolling players again instead of civil servants. <laughs> be disastrous. Oh, surely not. Didn't you say that the theatre was about plays and actors, not bricks and mortar? Oh yes, yes, but that was uh, that was. Look, the National Theatre must have a home, and so it will. Lots of homes. All the subsidised theatres would be called national theatres. They'd be the National Theatre at Glasgow, the National Theatre at Sheffield, the National Theatre at Bristol, and so on. And that three million could help them all. You'd just be the London branch of the National Theatre. I should think that would be very popular with the whole profession. Barbarism. What, spending money on actors instead of buildings? Yes. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Anyway, it's just one of my options. I may decide against it, or I may not. I could outline it in my speech, if necessary. <laughs> it all depends. On? Oh, changing the subject, have you decided what you're going to say in your speech yet? Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, well, uh, not uh, finally. Because I wondered if those jokes about government waste were really very funny. Of course, it's your decision. I'm sure you understand me. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, free silence for Simon Monk, Esquire, the managing director of the National Theatre. Mr. Prime Minister, my lords, Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you will have read this morning of the grant for the Arts Council and the National Theatre. 
I know many of us are disappointed by the amount. <laughs> of course, we would have all liked it to have been larger, but apparently this is a time of national stringency and we must think in terms of national needs. There are many calls on the public purse. Education, inner cities, health, kidney machines. <laughs> I think we should be glad that any increase at all has been possible and grateful to our guest of honour whose, whose personal intervention made even this small breadstick possible. Uh, increase. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to our guest of honour, the patron of the arts, the Prime Minister. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, the toast is... Excellent speech, don't you think, Humphrey? The patron of the arts, the Prime Minister! Yes, Prime Minister. <laughs> he can see you now. Sir Humphrey, he's, he's very worried that he seems responsible for something he can't change. Yes, I'm sure. Responsibility without power, the prerogative of the unit throughout the ages. <laughs> <Prime> <laughs> Morning, Humphrey. What was that you were saying? Oh, nothing, Prime Minister. I understand that you're worried about the local education authority. No, Humphrey, I'm worried about the Department of Education and Science. Indeed. In my opinion, the DES does a splendid job. Be that as it may. Look what's happened to education in this country. This is a question from a religious studies paper. Which do you prefer, atom bombs or charity? <laughs> <laughs> Maths is becoming politicised. If it costs five billion pounds a year to maintain Britain's nuclear defences, and 75 pounds a year to feed a starving African child, how many African children could be saved from starvation if the Ministry of Defence abandoned nuclear weapons? <laughs> That's easy, none. They'd spend it all on conventional weapons. <laughs> In any case, it's just a sum. Five billion divided by 75. But the children aren't learning how to do the sums. No, indeed, but the local education authorities might argue that they don't need to. They all have pocket calculators. But they all need to know how it's done. Look, we were all taught basic arithmetic, weren't we? Were we? What's 3,947 divided by 73? Uh, oh, I'd need a pencil and paper to do that. No, never mind that. <laughs> I could do it when I left school. But now you'd use a calculator. D that's not the point. I mean, look at Latin. Hardly anybody knows that nowadays. Tempera mutanta no set mutama in illis. <laughs> times change and we change with the times. Not oh, precisely. Si tecuis es, philosophus mensis es. What does that mean? If you'd kept your mouth shut, we might have thought you were clever. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, not you, Prime Minister. No, that's the translation. Uh, no one would ever have thought Sir Humphrey was saying that about you. Go away, Bernard, please. <laughs> I can't believe it, Humphrey. You had a conventional, strict academic upbringing. Are you denying the value of it? Well, what's the use of it? I can't even call upon it in conversation with the Prime Minister of Great Britain. <laughs> Education in this country is a disaster. We're supposed to be preparing children for a working life. Three quarters of the time, they're bored stiff. Well, I should have thought that being bored stiff for three quarters of the time was an excellent preparation for working life. <laughs> The school leaving age was raised to 16 so that they could learn more and they're learning less. We didn't raise it to enable them to learn more. We raised it to keep teenagers off the job market and hold down the unemployment figures. Are you saying there's nothing wrong with education in this country? No, of course not, Prime Minister. It's a joke. It's always been a joke. And as long as you leave it in the hands of the local councillors, it will remain a joke. I mean, half of them are your enemies anyway, and the other half are the sort of friends who make you prefer your enemies. <laughs> well, what are you saying? I'm saying that education will never get any better as long as it's subject to all that tomfoolery in the town halls. I mean, just imagine what would happen if you put defence in the hands of the local authorities. Defence? Yes, give the local councils a hundred million each and ask them to defend themselves. We wouldn't have to worry about the Russians. We'd have a civil war in three weeks. <laughs> You're just being silly. Am I, Prime Minister? Well, that's what happened to education. And why? Because nobody thinks that education is serious the way defence is serious. You mean that's why civil defence is left in the hands of local authorities? Of course, because everybody knows it's a joke. You just don't leave important matters in the hands of those clowns. And as you've left education to them, one must assume that until now you have attached little importance to it. I think it's extremely important. 
It could lose me in the next election. Ah! <laughs> in my naivety, I thought you were concerned about the future of our children. You oh, say, me, Humphrey, yeah. come in. Sit down. I just want to bounce an idea off you. Mm -hmm. I've realised how to reform the educational system. Excellent, Prime Minister. <laughs> I'm going to let parents take their children away from school and move them to any school they want. Oh, you mean after application, scrutiny, tribunal hearing and appeals procedures? No, Humphrey, just move them whenever they want to. I'm sorry, I don't quite follow. This government is going to let parents decide which schools to send their children to. Prime Minister, you can't be serious. <laughs> um, but it's preposterous. Why? Well, you can't expect parents to make these choices. I mean, how on earth would parents know which schools are best? <laughs> which school did you go to, Humphrey? Winchester. <laughs> Is it good? Oh, excellent, of course. Who chose it? My parents, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's different, Prime Minister. My parents were discerning people. You can't expect ordinary people to know where to send their children. Why not? Well, how could they tell? Well, they could tell if their kids could read, write and do sums. They could tell if their neighbours were happy with the school and they could tell if the exam results were good. Exam results aren't everything, Prime Minister. That's true. And those parents who don't want an academic education for their children can choose progressive schools. But parents have no qualifications to make these choices. I mean, teachers are the professionals. Parents are the worst people to bring up children. <laughs> they have no qualifications, no training. You don't expect untrained teachers to teach. The same should apply to parents. You mean, before people have children, they should be trained? No, that's no problem. They've all been trained to have kids. <laughs> Sex education classes have been standard for some years now. I see. Well, perhaps we could do better. Before people are allowed to have children, we should make them sit exams, written and practical. <laughs> perhaps both. And then they could be issued with breeding licenses. <laughs> Oh, very droll, Prime Minister. <laughs> no, but I'm being serious. It's looking after children that parents are not qualified for. That's why they have no idea which schools to choose. It couldn't work. Then how does the health service work? People choose their family doctor without having medical qualifications. Ah, yes. Well, that's different. How? Well, doctors are... <laughs> Patients aren't parents, dear lady. Oh, really? What makes you think that, Humpy? <laughs> Not as such, in any case. As a matter of fact, I think letting people choose doctors is a very bad idea. Very messy. Much tighter to allocate people to GPs. Much fairer. Then we can even out the numbers and everyone has an equal chance of getting the bad doctors. See? In any case, we're not talking about health, we're talking about education. And with respect, Prime Minister, I think that the DES will react with some caution to your rather novel proposal. You mean they'll block it? I mean they will give it the most serious and urgent consideration and insist on a thorough and rigorous examination of all the proposals allied to a detailed feasibility study and a budget analysis before producing a consultative document for consideration by all interested bodies and seeking comments and recommendations to be included in a brief for a series of working parties who will produce individual studies which will provide the background for a more wide-ranging document considering whether or not the proposal should be taken forward to the next stage. You mean they'll block it? Yep. Ah, <laughs> oh, come in, come in, Humphrey. Prime Minister, I want to talk to you about Prime Minister's question. Thank Prime you. Today. I accept your congratulations. Uh, well, I wasn't, wasn't I brilliant? Uh, well, I didn't... Didn't uh, you think so? Well, I wasn't oh, there, but... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't I brilliant, Bernard? Uh, uh, well, I believe your replies this afternoon will not be quickly forgotten. Uh, let me tell you what happened, Humphrey. <laughs> the first question was about that Home Office cock-up over the shortage of prison officers. My reply was masterly. I said, I refer the Honourable Member to the speech I made in this House on October the 28th. Did he remember what you'd said? Well, no, of course not. Neither did I come to that. <laughs> Still, it shut him up. The next one was about unemployment and whether the Department of Employment fiddled the figures. You mean periodically restructure the base from which the statistics have been derived without drawing public attention to the fact? Exactly, fiddle the figures. <laughs> well, of course they do. I know they do. But I said I'd found no significant evidence of it. 
That's because you haven't been looking. And because we haven't shown you. I know. Well done, Humphrey. Then we went straight on to a googly about the Department of Energy's plans for disposing of nuclear waste. The question was trying to get me to admit that the Cabinet was divided. Well, it is. Well, I know that. So I said, my Cabinet took a unanimous decision. That's only because you threatened to dismiss anyone who wouldn't agree. <laughs> you certainly made them agree unanimously. <laughs> By this time, my backbenchers were cheering my every word. Oh, yeah. then we had a question about why, since we'd spent so much money on it, our new anti-missile missile was scrapped as obsolete the day before the first one came off the production line. <laughs> and how did you wriggle out of that one? Wriggled out? That was my masterstroke. My reply, Humphrey, was sheer genius. I simply said our policy had not been as effective as we hoped. Clearly, we had got it wrong. <laughs> you admitted that? Yeah, brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> Took the wind right out of his sails. <laughs> Honesty always gives you the advantage of surprise in the House of Commons. <laughs> there was actually a supplementary. The Prime Minister was asked when he would request the resignation from the responsible minister. Too easy. I said I'll ask for his resignation when he makes a mistake that could have been seen at the time and not with the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> they were on their feet, cheering, stamping, waving their order papers. I gather that there was a question about the bugging of an MP's telephone. Oh, yes, I got a terrific laugh with that. I said... I know Bernard <laughs> told me. No, I said, much as I respect... Yes, John... I know, Bernard told me. Oh. oh, well, anyway, that was just stupid. I mean, why should we bug Hugh Halifax's telephone? I mean, one of my own administration. Don't know where they got such a daft idea. Sheer paranoia. Yes, the only thing is... I mean, that... why should we listen to MPs? Boring, stupid, ignorant windbags? <laughs> I do my best not to listen to them. And he's only a PPS. I have enough trouble finding out what's going on at the Ministry of Defence. What could he know? So, I gather you denied that Mr Halifax's phone had been bugged. Well, obviously. It was the one question today to which I could give a clear, simple, straightforward, honest answer. Yes. Unfortunately, although the answer was indeed clear, simple and straightforward, there is some difficulty in justifiably assigning to it the fourth of the epithets you applied to the statement. <laughs> in as much as the precise correlation between the information you communicated and the facts insofar as they can be determined and demonstrated is such as to cause epistemological problems <laughs> of sufficient magnitude as to lay upon the logical and semantic resources of the English language a heavier burden than they can reasonably be expected to bear. <laughs> Epistemological? What are you talking about? You told a lie. A lie? A lie. What do you mean, a lie? I mean, you... lied. <laughs> uh, yes, I know this is a difficult concept to get across to a politician. Um, <laughs> you, uh, well, um, ah, yes, you did not tell the truth. You mean, we are bugging you, Halifax's telephone? We were. We were? When did we stop? Um, 17 minutes ago. <laughs> Quite even separating out the component causes, let alone allocating responsibility for them, is a task of such analytical delicacy as not to be susceptible of compression within the narrow confines of a popular radio program. Humphrey <laughs> <laughs> Appleby, thank you very much. <laughs> if that was a popular program, what would an unpopular program be like? <laughs> thank you very much, Sir Humphrey. Oh. Absolutely splendid. My pleasure, thank you. Was I all right? Well, couldn't you have said a bit more, especially about unemployment? <laughs> Such as? Well, uh, the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you laugh? Oh, my dear Ludo, nobody tells the <laughs> truth about unemployment. Oh, why not? Well, because everybody knows you could halve it in a few weeks. But how? Cut off all social security to any claimant who refuses two job offers. There's genuine unemployment in the north, but the south of England is awash with layabouts, many of them <laughs> graduates, living off the dole and housing benefit, plus quite a lot of cash they pick up without telling anybody. You mean uh, moonlighting? Well, sunlighting, really. Most employers will tell you they're short-staffed, but offer the unemployed a street-sweeping job or a dishwashing job, they'd be off the register before you could say parasite. <laughs> Frankly, this country can have as much unemployment as it's prepared to pay for in Social Security, and no politicians have got the guts to do anything about it. Oh, I do wish you'd said that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come along, Bernard, come on. Uh, what's this for? The BBC have just sent me this tape. Apparently it's part of my interview. They say it's particularly interesting. <laughs> uh, your interview? 
You sound surprised that I should have said something interesting, Bernard. Oh, uh, no, no, uh, Sir Humphrey. It's just that I thought you uh, intended to say nothing, as always. I mean, uh... Switch it on, Bernard. You may learn something. <laughs> <laughs> My dear Ludo, nobody tells the truth about unemployment. Oh? Why not? Because everyone knows you could have it in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> Social Security to all claimants who refuse two job offers. <laughs> <laughs> and no politicians have got the guts to do anything about it. <laughs> Sir Humphrey, that wasn't you, was it? <laughs> yes, Bernard. But how could you say such things? Is there any more? <laughs> yes, Bernard. As damaging of, as what we've just heard? More damaging. <laughs> I believe I referred to parasites. How could you be so indiscreet? The interview was over. We were just chatting harmlessly. Harmless. It was off the record. It was on the tape. <laughs> oh my God, I've just realised. Blackmail. Blackmail? Read that. Here is a copy of your off-the-record part of the radio interview. We found it very interesting. We will contact you shortly. What do they want of me, Bernard? The BBC? Licence fee up 50%? <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's a private blackmail by the producer. Well, maybe. Doesn't he know I'm a poor man? <laughs> Maybe he hasn't read you live in abject poverty on 81,000 a year. <laughs> Bernard, what am I going to do? Well, keep your mouth shut in future. And so must you, Bernard. I don't want you to breathe a word about this to anyone. Anyone, do you hear? Yeah, my duty to the... Bernard, I don't... <laughs> oh, Bernard, what am I going to do? Well, perhaps you should put out a press statement expressing sympathy for the unemployed. <laughs> well, you may be joining them any moment. 